Hello, I am Rachel McLean, Community Relations Liaison with The Mather, a forward-thinking life plan community being developed in Tysons for those 62 and better. Our community is projected to open in 2023 and we are currently taking reservations. At The Mather, we recognize that art infuses our lives with vibrancy and meaning and we are so honored to be able to support the McLean Project for the Arts Meet the Artist series. Enjoy the conversation. Welcome back if you've been with us previously this week for our Meet the Artist series. I'm Lori Carboneau, Executive Director of McLean Project for the Arts, and we are delighted to have the opportunity during this virtual art fest to find time with each of our artists. If you're like me and you've been frustrated by the end of the day of Art Fest in the park when you haven't had a chance to get to know all the artists, well, this is your chance. Tonight, we thank June Linowitz, our MPA board member. She's an artist, She's a nonprofit executive and she's helped us be resilient during these days. One of the ways is by spending time with each of our artists. She's helping us to understand the mediums, the motivation, and the backgrounds for th three of our artists tonight, John Cooper, Begonia Morton, and Hilary Hatchie. Thanks for being with us tonight. And June, thank you again for this opportunity to be with you. Good night. Hello and welcome to MPA ArtFest Artist Talks. My name is June Linowitz and I'm a member of the board of the McLean Project for the Arts. I'm very happy to welcome you to these MPA artist interviews and to personally introduce you to three fantastic artists who are in exhibiting their work as MP part of MPA ArtFest. As many of you are aware, MPA ArtFest is now in its 14th year. This is a different year because it's the first year that we're virtual. But MPA continues to bring art and community together by offering events, music, artwork, and so much more. This year, ArtFest will be up and running online for two weeks because we're visual and we can do that. It will be October 14th through 18th. This year, we've been pleased to receive more applications than usual from artists who want to be included in MPA Art Fest. Of this historic number of entries, we've juried 15 outstanding artists into MPA Art Fest, and we will be featuring their work online. Please do take time to browse the many virtual studios of the artist section of the website. You may not only see what the artists are creating, you have an opportunity to purchase their art. Today, I'm excited to introduce you to three wonderful artists. John Cooper is an outstanding fine art photographer. Begonia Morton is an accomplished painter working in oils. And Hilary Hatchie creates beautiful and intriguing jewelry pieces. And so without further ado, I introduce you to John Cooper. Thank Hi, you, John. June. Hi, June. It's a pleasure to see you. It's a pleasure to, to see you and to be a member of, of, of the MPA Art Fest. You've had an interesting and varied career. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Well, I'm not a professional photographer, although I have had a passion for photography for most of my life. I um, have had a career. I'm retired as a uh, chief financial officer of a um, large independent power company. And before that, I've basically arranged financing for various um, renewable energy and infrastructure projects around the world, working for 
Pacific Gas and Electric and Bechtel. Um, over the last 15 years, I've basically been working with startup renewable energy ventures and helping them to raise to raise uh, early stage capital. Um, I, I began uh, my photography thinking back as probably a photographer for my eighth grade yearbook. Um, my father was a fine a black and white photographer, although as an amateur, we had a dark room in our house when I was growing up. <clears throat> and so I've uh, done a lot of uh, dark room work and black and white photography sort of migrating to digital over the last 10 or 15, I guess 15 years um, as digital um, cameras and printers have, have improved to approach the quality of, uh, of working in the dark room. Was that a hard transition? From um, the digital? Not with color photography, but black and white photography. Um, it was early on with the printers, at least that I was using, it was difficult to get the kind of um, tonality that you were able to get in a silver gelatin print. But I think now the, the, the quality is, appro is approaching what I could produce in a dark room. Going back over your background, you've lived abroad a fair amount, right? I've lived abroad quite a bit. Um, I spent a year of graduate school in, in Italy, and my first jobs were in West Africa, um, in working for NGOs in Guinea and in Niger. And then when I was working uh, um, after, I spent also several other years uh, working in Geneva um, in finance and have traveled a great deal. Most of my project work has been international. And how has that informed your art? Do you have a sense of that? Um, I mostly take photographs when I'm traveling, and so it's provided me an opportunity to be in um, various parts of the world where I've found images that, uh, that struck me and have contributed to my, my photography. And what have been the major influences in your photography? Where have you studied? Anything you want to share along those lines? I really uh, self-taught. Um, I did take a, when I lived in California, I was a member of the Friends of Photography, which was a, 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 a photographic group in Carmel founded by Ansel Adams. And I was fortunate to take a master class uh, from him one weekend in, in Carmel. Um, and Well, that must have been wonderful. What is, um, if you could summarize what the approach of Ansel Adams was and how it influenced you, do you have anything to say along those lines? Well, his, his photographs have always influenced me because he, he produces just magnificent black and white photographs with extraordinary tonality of, of light and shadow um, using what he uh, Called, invented and called the the zone the zone system, um, and he explained he was a very old man when I when I took this class, um, so it was really the aura of being in his presence uh, along with others in the class. Um, but I think I, I I learned by imitation or trying to imitate some of his uh, his works and uh, have a, many of his books, but certainly not of his uh, none of his original prints. Um, but I visited many of the sites out west where where his famous photographs had, have been taken, but I've certainly never really approached his his artistry. Well, you sent sent me a few of your photographs online, and I have to say that I could see the influence, or at least I think they're wonderful nature photography. Oh, thank you. You tend to focus on nature and um, landscape and architecture. Is that correct? Yes. Say that's true. Yes, very much the outdoors. I mean, we uh, lo we love we love the outdoors. We travel a lot. We, you know, we go hiking and and camping. Well, we don't go camping anymore. But but uh, um, so I'm always schlepping a camera of one sort or another along with me. And uh, um, so mostly mostly outdoors pictures. And I've I've had the opportunity to to be in some very special parts of, of the world that, that were unexpected and, and beautiful landscapes and great 
uh, plays of shadow and, and brightness and textures and things like that. Um, such as? Such as there's a, uh, there's a national park in Colorado that encourages people, at least I'd never heard of. I was there on a business trip um, uh, staying in a, a lodge, but it's called Great Sand Dunes National Park national monument or national park and there are these extraordinary sand dunes in the middle of Colorado um, that are at the end of a valley that have resulted in the sand being built up over eons of just individual particles blowing with the wind and uh, it was late fall and it was cold and windy and uh, and I was kind of traipsing around these dunes there was nobody else there and uh, it was sunset and the the wind blowing the sand over the tops of the dunes and the light was very special. I think one of those photographs might be in, in the show. <clears throat> I hope so, because I'd like to see it. I'm sorry? Yeah, I hope so, because I'd like to see it. Yeah, it, 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 it was one of my, it was a, it, a really awesome experience and the, the photographs came out well. Um, when was your first gallery show and how did that come about? Uh, my first and only gallery show was uh, at Glen Echo at the Photo Works Gallery. Um, just on a whim, I uh, uh, submitted a portfolio on a call for artists uh, in 1996. They have an annual call for artists, and they, they mount, I think, four major shows of either individual artists or small groups of artists um, on a theme. And... Um, and so I, I entered that show and was selected, uh, or I entered that, that uh, uh, solicitation and was selected for a gallery show that was held for, I guess, six weeks in August of 1996, or 2000, I'm sorry, 2016. And um, I had about 16, 16 photographs in the show um, and gave a gallery talk and it was, it was very exciting. It sold a few pieces, so that was nice. You work in both black and white and color. Yes. And how do you decide when you're going to do which? Um, well, with digital, you can go either way. Well, if you've taken, you know, you can go either way. And so, you know, I kind of experiment with, uh, with pictures that are in color with, with looking at them in black and white to see whether the tonality and the textures and the, uh, the play of light and dark um, and, uh, you know, provide some sort of an emotional connection. And, and those pictures I'll often do in black and white um, and other pictures um, color. I think it's much more difficult to do a good black and white picture than a, than a color picture. Oh, that's interesting. I would have that. I wouldn't have expected that. That's interesting. Um, do you have advice for new photographers just starting out? <laughs> um, take a lot of pictures. I think that the, the difference between a professional photographer and a, and a good amateur photographer is just the professional photographer will take a hundred pictures for every one picture that that you take and and get and is bound, you know, get, get one or two that may be, may be suitable. Um, so carry a camera and, and uh, uh, whether it's a big camera or a small camera, I would still love to do uh, darkroom work, but um, my darkroom still exists, but it's uh, chemicals and paper haven't been touched in probably 15 years. Um, but, um, you know, use, use good materials and, you uh, um, use a good printing source, or if, you, if you're not doing your own, um, joining a cooperative uh, darkroom um, can be very helpful, like the Friends of Photography, I mean, or, or, or the Glen Echo uh, Photo Works Gallery has a wonderful uh, um, photography program, as well as uh, great digital, as well as um, wet darkroom facilities, um, but just taking lots of pictures and, you know, just uh, blowing them up large um, um, and seeing what comes out. And um, do you have a favorite, favorite camera that you like to use? Um, early on, well, I used to uh, I used to use a medium format camera, Mamiya 
um, for my black and whites, which produced a, a nice um, six by four, six, four, five negatives. Um, and, and that was important if you're doing darkroom work because you can get much more um, uh, larger enlargements uh, without losing the detail and grain. Um, I've used Nikon cameras for years and years. Um, and I recently just switched to a lighter weight mirrorless 35 millimeter camera, which is a Fuji. Um, and uh, I've had it about a year. <clears throat> and before COVID, took it on a trip to New Zealand and took a lot of pictures. And it's a great camera. So it has great lenses. Are you finding places to photograph around here now that you can't travel the same way? Yeah, um, we uh, we have two dogs, two golden retrievers, and every morning we go to a park in McLean called Scotts Run, which is a forest forest park uh, near the Potomac. It's several hundred acres and it's woods, and and it's fascinating to go to a place like that every day of the year, rain or shine, um, because you see the minute changes. And mush right now it's mushroom season, so so I take a, a lot of pictures of mushrooms and things but uh, um, and our dogs and and then uh, in the hill in the Shenandoah Valley also in Skyline Drive where we go. So um, that's pretty much how you adjust to, to COVID. And oh yeah and, you know, but I have a lot more time to work at home on old negatives old pictures and make prints and than I did before. That's good. Um, well Thank you very much for this interview. It's been wonderful talking with you. And I'm sure that people will enjoy um, going to see your work at the MPA Art Fest. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, June. I look forward to seeing all the other artists in the Art Fest this week. Hello, I'm welcoming, and I'm very pleased to welcome our next artist, Begonia Morton. Hello, Begonia. Can you tell me a little about yourself? Oh, hello, June. Uh, thank you for having me today in this wonderful interview. Um, yes, well, I'm from Spain. I was born in Barcelona, uh, mm -hmm. and I came to the States uh, 11 years ago. Yeah. So in between, um, a lot of things have happened. Um, I lived in many countries when I was a child and afterwards uh, I had different works, uh, different jobs. And so uh, finally I became an artist, a uh, professional artist, just about eight or nine years ago. Hmm. Hmm. You have a background in economics, right? I do. <laughs> What moved you to becoming an artist? Well, uh, I painted all my life. Yes. When I was very little, I was painting all the time. And um, my parents told me when I was in third grade, my teacher told my parents I had to go to some training because I really enjoyed it. And I was all the time drawing and painting in class. So I was very, very lucky because just five minutes from my house, um, there was the best fine art academy of my city. I lived in Valencia at the time. Mm -hmm. And it was a university for adults, but they had a, a small program for children and they accepted me. So I, I was trained from that age until I went to university, to my university. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I really uh, got the training, but I never had a title, you know, from a proper fine art academy. Um, what I did is I, I chose economics because I also like it very much. And uh, that was a better uh, possible living for me. Um, and then I went to Brussels and I started working as an economist. I was a lobbyist uh, for 15 years in, in Brussels, representing Spanish interests and uh, until we came here. So then my life changed tremendously. <laughs> then you dedicated yourself to art when you came here? Yeah. Yeah, so, cool. yeah what, what I thought is, 
um, the kids were little. They were five and seven. Mm-hmm. And uh, it was a new country and continent for, for the kids and for myself. My husband is American. Uh-huh. Uh, so um, I decided not to go back to work straight away. And um, just take time with the kids and help them as well. And uh, so I started going to classes just to 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 refresh painting. And it's something I always wanted to, to do again. Uh, and you know, I took classes for maybe uh, two years. And then I decided that I had to follow uh, what I really liked and develop some kind of yeah. technique for myself, you know, and, and style. And then, then that's what I did. Mm. Um, when did you have your first show and how did that come about? Oh, my first show as a professional, uh, it was in Great Falls, Virginia. Uh-huh. And at the time I was doing some, I was painting flags uh, and I started painting the American flag and it was painted with acrylics and mixed media. I used burlap and uh, papers from newspaper and, and, and other things. And um, I, I decided to do an exhibition, but uh, not only with the American flag, but to paint as many flags as uh, people live in this area. So I made a little research and I find out the, the, the 25 uh, nationalities uh, that are uh, living around here, uh, between us. And then my decision was to make uh, uh, an exhibition uh, representing these people. So I created an American flag that was going to go on the top and then the other flag of these people on the bottom. And that one represented one person. So I did 25 of those. And it was it was very well attended uh, exhibit and I, I had a lot of fun. And, and that I think uh, put me uh, in the map for the local artists, mm-hmm. yeah. Well, what the great idea for a show for an international area, really great idea. Thank you. You worked a la prima, right? You're, yeah. I do not, I have to say this is a different approach than I know. And so I'd really be interested in hearing why you do that and what first interested you um, and have you talk about that. Yeah, I, well, I have to say, I worked a la prima during many years. The first years when I decided uh, to stop training, uh, uh, going, going to, to, to a teacher, uh, I joined um, a movement in America, what well, is international movement, that is called uh, Painting a Day. So uh, I started painting one painting, not every day, but when you start the painting, you have to finish in that one day. So I painted about three, four paintings a week. And that was a la prima, because it was, well, it was a small painting, I could finish it. And that gave me a lot of training. Uh Then I started going to MPA Art Fest with these paintings. And as people were purchasing them, I could buy more materials and then do more. So I, I, I created, I think almost, 200 paintings that way. That gave me a lot of training for what I wanted to do. And then uh, when I, I, I decided I wanted to go bigger because those paintings were about six by, by, by 10 maybe or by eight. And I decided to go a little bit bigger. Then I needed more time. So then I start uh, a painting, but I don't finish in one day. It takes me these days a classic painting, it takes me minimum, I will say, one week. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. I was, okay, so painting, going back to painting, one painting a day. Yeah. Can you talk with me about what you learn by working that way? Working so that you do, what is it that you learn that you don't necessarily know if you take longer? The uh, experience of it. Yes, important, very important. When I, I was uh, 
studying art here in the area. Um, I was the slowest student in the class. <laughs> <laughs> so every, you know how classes uh, here are, they are for about nine weeks. So at the end of, of, of the week nine, my painting wasn't finished. Everybody else had finished their paintings and my painting wasn't because I wanted to keep going and going and perfect it. Right. And um, that's the, the, the reason why I went complete opposite. I had to finish in one day. So my decisions were fast and I had to be happy with, I ha with what I had. That makes a lot of sense to me. Mm -hmm. I can understand how that would be a really an excellent learning experience. Yeah, it was for me, yes. Yeah. So now you're more class, the, you have a painting behind you. I, I, have, I have two. You have two. Yes, because um, I, I'm doing two different things these days. One, I continue with my classic oils, as I said, a little bit bigger than before. And the other thing I'm doing is uh, what I call my modern series. And my modern series are bigger paintings. That's my modern series, the mm -hmm. big one. And right. they are, um, I, I have a mixed media because I do part of it in acrylics and part of it in oils. Oh, that's interesting. Yes, it's, uh, it's, it, uh, I came up with this idea uh, because I wanted to create something more than the classics that I was doing. Right. And, um, Two years ago, when we were in Barcelona, um, there was an exhibition of Picasso in the Picasso Museum of Barcelona. I have been there, yes. Ah, it's a beautiful <laughs> place, yeah. So that summer, they had the exhibit called Picasso's Kitchen. So they mm -hmm. gathered uh, paintings about uh, his still lives from all, all around the world and put it in the museum. So I, I always go to see what's there. And uh, well, I, as I like still lives, it was amazing to me to see what else people did with it, right? Because I was focusing on classical art, on the Flemish school very much, because I spent 15 years in Brussels. So that right. gave me also a lot of inspiration, apart from the old masters in Spain as well. Right. Uh, but then looking at that, I thought, well, why don't I try to do something a little bit different? And then that summer I didn't paint, but I thought a lot, you know, uh, you keep thinking as an artist and then coming back. Uh, you when you're not working. Yeah. 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 When you're not working, you, you, yes. you think yes. about what else, right? And so, um, Coming back, I decided to, to, to incorporate the two things, kind of a semi-abstract, mm -hmm. but also uh, put my, my oil painting in it. So this, uh, and as an example, if, if, if I can show you, um, both have the subject matter of cherries. Yes. So then these, these cherries are painted in oil and are kind of more, um, realistic, right. while the rest of the painting is acrylic and is not as realistic. It's, uh, you can see just maybe the form is kind of an unfinished, it's not painted. It is, yes. painted, but it's muted, right? It has more gray. It's a lot of contrast between the two areas. Right. So that's what I, <laughs> I have. That's exciting. Yeah. Thanks. I, I've been doing this uh, for two years and uh, I keep doing it. So um, I'm, I'm very interested in the different compositions that I can create and it's a, it's a little bit of storytelling with yes. this. Hmm. Um, is, are those paintings going to be in MPA Mark Fet, Art Fest? Yes, they are. They are, both of them. I can show you this one closer because I think you don't get the light. Yes. But this is the other type. Oh, wow. How beautiful. Thank you. So yes. this is a typical of my classic paintings. Yes. So the, the difference yes. is quite big. 
<laughs> right, I can see the difference. Is there any motto or creed you live by as an artist? Is there anything? Yeah. I, I would say I do have several, but uh, important for me is to be true to my roots. Uh, I, I have uh, a family who uh, is both very international, but has a lot of traditions. So uh, I like to keep that. I like to keep that for myself and I like to keep it for my children. So I work a lot on that. And I think for the paintings also goes with it because mm -hmm. of my background and my training and all my inspiration. I, I like to, to be true to that, to be original as well. Yes. I, I, I don't want to copy anybody or, or feel like I'm copying. You know, I want to I do my thing. Right. And um, I, I would say the other thing will be the quality. You know, I, I want to make pieces that people will cherish forever. Yes. You know, I, I like when people buy one and then they say, oh, I'm going to have this and I'm going to pass it to my children. That, that makes me so proud. Mm. But that, I would say that is imp very important for me. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's, that's wonderful and I can understand that. I think probably our time is up, but oh. I want to say I have enjoyed talking with you so much I could talk with you for a half an hour or more. I think your paintings are beautiful and I really look forward to seeing them. And hopefully everybody will visit at MPA Art Fest. We'll go to the artist studio that you have and purchase something that they pass on to their children. Thank you so much, June, for this opportunity. I appreciate your help and this wonderful interview. And thank you for uh, also this wonderful time from MPA Art Fest. It's been a pleasure. Bye. Bye-bye. Hello, and it's my great pleasure to welcome Hillary Hashi. Hillary, hi. 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 Can you tell me a little about yourself and your background? For uh, sure. Courses, education, whatever you want to share. Sure. Um, I am um, a Baltimore artist. I um, work with mostly sterling silver. I make jewelry. Um, I also use some gold and some alternative materials as well. Um, I've kind of always been an artist and uh, even in high school I did some like um, summer programs at Moore College of Art in Philadelphia. And then um, I did a lot of clay work in college and uh, I guess it just wasn't quite speaking to me. And then I somehow fell into doing uh, a jewelry class at Maryland Institute College of Art. And uh, it's just kind of everything made sense to me when I took the classes. I didn't feel like I needed to take notes or anything. You know, it just was like, oh, well, once you have the tools, Oh, this totally makes sense to me, you know. So metal working was definitely my niche, you know, it just spoke to me. And so um, I took classes at Maryland Institute College of Art for maybe three years in metal smithing. And uh, I did some apprenticeships. Um, and then I started out on my own going to art fairs and selling my work. And uh, it's been over 20 years now. Wow. <laughs> so, Good for you. Yeah. yeah. Have you all, you're in Baltimore now. Have you always been in, lived in Baltimore? You grew up in Baltimore? I grew up in Philadelphia, but I came to Baltimore for school and I stayed. Yeah. So I've actually now been in Baltimore longer than anywhere else, which is strange. Time flies. And you, and you pretty much, have, you're very lucky to have found your medium. So rapidly or so quickly maybe it doesn't feel that way maybe it feels like a struggle to you but um that's one yeah you know I, I sometimes i wish i had found it sooner and had more time to learn when i was younger uh when i think you just uh, absorb things more and there are maybe more 
uh, willing to take risks with your work and that sort of thing. But, uh, you know, things happen the way they happen. And there's, you know, you never know. Sometimes your major influences, would you say? Um, my work's very, um, architectural. So I, I think I kind of, I just, I don't think, you, and I don't know if this is true for other artists. I, I think it probably is that you don't even realize what's influencing you. And then you start making things and, and you, and you say, oh, I didn't realize like all this that's going on around me is, is I'm internalizing it and I'm, I'm, reproducing it in my own way in the studio so um for instance i do a, a big line of work now that i like quite a bit that i call scaffolding and um not too many years ago there was a very large building going up in my neighborhood i walked by it every day walking my dog and all you know it was completely covered in scaffolding and uh i think it just I started making pieces that kind of had this look of this, you know, skeletal frame of a building or something. And uh, I think it just, you know, it, it, you don't even realize that you're doing that. I know at one time I made a piece of a, a pair of earrings. This was years ago. I don't make them anymore, but I live in a pretty old house here in Baltimore. And uh, later that night, we, my husband and I sat down to dinner and I was staring at our, um, you know, we have um, forced, uh, um hot water heat so we have the big old radiators and uh i said oh that's the earring i just made it looks just like that radiator <laughs> you know so you just i think you just internalize things sometimes and you don't even realize it but a lot of my work too i think is it's not just architectural but sort of like this intersection between uh what humans um build and how it relates to the natural world around us so, you know, there's sort of this um, organic feel to it, too. Mm -hmm. um, so, and also a little bit of, um, maybe a, a little bit of a commentary on our cities and uh, how they've developed and um, how people have fled cities and left behind sort of a, a skeleton of, of a, a once vibrant community, you know? Um, well, that's interesting. So, yeah, I think, you know, I see a lot of it in Baltimore. There's so many um, neighborhoods that are abandoned yeah. uh, and the city is certainly not, um, does not have a huge population like it used to. And there's a lot, you know, a, a lot of economic, social, political uh, things behind all of that that I find, you know, fascinating and disturbing. Uh -huh. So I don't, I don't like to harp on it too much because I don't know how much people want to wear a piece of jewelry that has some sort of like strife and sadness behind it, you know? Um, but it doesn't, I, feel that. I it doesn't feel like that from what I looked at on your website. You don't have that. There's not a sense of angst to it at all. Good. It's, I don't, I don't want there to be. I also, and I do have some pieces that I don't, so, yeah, I do have some work that I make sort of just for myself, mm -hmm. you know, that's maybe more angsty that, <laughs> that I don't really um, think is particularly sellable or for a, you know, a, an audience at an art show who wants to, you know, buy a nice pair of earrings. My response to your work was that it would be, and it's funny after what you've just, or it's interesting, is that it would be, some of them look like they could be monumental sculpture. Yes. I can see them and see them huge. And which is funny because they've started huge, right? That's the influence right. is huge. You've made it small, and my response is that could be huge. So right. and I've I I've, I've dreamed of being able to do larger scale work, but um, you know, there's a lot that goes into that that I don't have the um, access to. Uh, but maybe one day, um, you know, if I can partner up with the right person or team, 
I could do sure. something like that. So. How did, when was your first show and how did that come about? I mean, so, um, well, I, while I was still in school taking classes, I apprenticed for an artist who did show, you know, did art shows for a living, traveled around the country. Uh, mm -hmm. And so I started, you know, sometimes going to the shows with her and helping her. So I was seeing uh, an avenue that I could do that. And also even before that, um, in undergrad, I had an art teacher, a clay teacher, who uh, would make us go to the American Craft Show in Baltimore, run by the American Craft Council, right. and you know, talk to an artist and come back and report on it. So it's kind of always there in my mind that this was a possibility. So I have to thank you know those teachers that were there way back, even before I started working with metal. Yeah, um, you know, showing me that there is some sort of avenue for you know your work um so by the time i went and did my first show which was probably in like maybe 1999 um i'd already you know helped the woman i apprenticed for many shows so i i had a really good sense of what went into it and it wasn't as intimidating or <laughs> worrisome and she helped me out and you know load me a tent and you know all the kind of things you need to to do a show um, but when I look back on it too I think um you know I kind of cringe at what my work looked like then and that sort of thing you know it's come a long way and I feel you know good about that um, yeah I think every artist cringes at their beginning work when they look at it yeah I mean thank yeah. goodness it means you're growing right yeah. yes <laughs> So that's a good thing. Are you shown with the Baltimore show now? The American Craft I'm sorry? Do you show with the American Craft Council now? Oh, yes, I do. I've, for uh, probably 10 to 15 years now, I've been showing, if not every year, almost, almost every year. Sometimes I take a break. I feel like, uh, you know, when you do the same show year after year, you start to see the same customers year after year. And sometimes you have to just give it a rest, you know. Um, well, NBA Art but yes. very lucky to have your work, I think. Well, thank you. I feel very lucky that I live in Baltimore where it happens. Um, you know, that's a great thing. What metals do you prefer working with? You said stainless, you said uh, silver, sterling. Uh, sterling silver, I work with the most. I, I like it the best. I think it's beautiful. It's very uh, white, um, which I like. Um, I, I also use 18 karat gold, sometimes yellow gold. I'm not as big of a fan of the yellow metal, um, personally. But a, a lot of times when I use the yellow gold, I mix it with sterling silver and then I oxidize the silver. So the yeah. silver gets black. And I really like, I do like the black and the gold together. I think that's a great look. But mm -hmm. anything I do, I like a lot of contrast. So even with the silver, a lot of times I'll oxidize part of the piece and then put the uh, like a matte finish on the rest. So the, when you use a matte finish, the silver looks whiter. Than a, than a like a mirror reflective finish, and I like that contrast. So there's a lot of uh, a lot a lot of that in all my finishing work, doing getting some sort of contrast in the piece. You use some gems too, right? Um, rarely. Okay. Um, I, I saw yeah, some I, red type, but not. Yeah, you you yeah you. I have a few pieces, um, mm -hmm. but it's not. Uh, it's not what I gravitate towards. I don't, I mean, so a lot of people who use gems, they really love them and they love going and to gem shows and looking at the stones and buying the stones. And, and you know, it's such a, and I, it just doesn't, I don't know. It just doesn't really draw me in. So right. I found other ways. Like I do like sometimes to incorporate something else into my piece. So I have, I have a group of work where I actually use fabric for color instead of gemstones. Wow. And I so I I fit it into to certain like areas in a piece and then sew it onto the frame of the metal. So it kind of it kind of has this Japanese screen feel to it. You can kind of see through it a little bit, but it's not. 
actually translucent. Mm -hmm. um, I think at that time I'd been looking at a lot of lighting. <laughs> I was buying a fixture for my house or something and just, you know, on the internet, lights, lights, lights. And, um, you know, so I was seeing a lot of these lampshades and, and I love, I like the idea of the light traveling through something and changing it. So um, that's one way I addressed kind of adding some color to my work that was non-traditional. Right. Do you work at one piece, one piece at a time, or do you, are you working at several at the same time? Uh, it like depends. When I'm, when I'm making inventory, so I, and I already have a design down pat, and I'm making a certain, you know, number, I need five pair of an earring or something, then I'm going to do them all at once in an assembly line sort of way. Mm -hmm. You know, I'll do all my cutting and then all my soldering and then all my finishing. It's a much more efficient way to work. But if I'm working on a new piece, I'm just working on the one. Um, I mean, I might walk away from it sometimes and work on something else, but that's my main focus. And that can come about, but it also comes about, I'm, I'll just have discarded things on my bench because I didn't know what to do. I, made, I started making something and I, then I didn't know what to do with it. And it'll sit on my bench sometimes for five years. <laughs> it's just sitting there. And then one day I pick it up and, and I say, oh, I, I don't know. I, figure, I just something clicks and I do yeah. something with it. So it's kind of like there's always stuff around me that's kind of waiting. Is your studio at home? It is, yes. Well, that's a good thing during this period of time. Yeah, um, <laughs> yes, it is. You don't have to yeah. travel, which yes. is not so easy. Is that a piece of yours around your neck? Yes, it is. I can't see it real well. You want to bring it closer? <laughs> is that better? Yeah, it is better. You can see it, but not too. It's beautiful. It looks like a scaffolding piece. Yes, yes. yes. And I have, a, I have a bracelet sort of like that here. Maybe because it's not on me, you can kind of see better. So that's like a... Oh, wow. Um, and so this, I did the oxidizing on the one side and the bright, uh, the white metal. Uh, and this has a little uh, clasp here and a hinge on this side. You can... Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah. So yeah, that is really this would be an example of a piece that I didn't do anything else while I was working on it because it's extremely complicated and there's a lot of things to kind of figure out as you're making it when you're working with making a clasp. Like, you know, I try to make a clasp that works with the piece so you don't really mm -hmm. see it. So it's all integrated. Um, so, you know, when I'm working on something like that, there's nothing else going on besides that piece. Right. Good. Do you have a motto or creed of your what you do? I mean, what's important to you that you have in your head while you're working? Well, I, I guess maybe almost even too much. Um, you know, I, I'm always thinking about the, the quality of the craftsmanship is very important to me. Yeah. Um, and sometimes when I'm making a piece, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm not satisfied with it and I'm not sure if I'm just being too hard on myself <laughs> or if, you know you know there's like because I'll I, I'll talk to other artists and they'll be like I don't like this and I, I said you're you're being silly there's nothing there you know um, and I'm sure I do that to myself too and it's hard to um, you know sometimes step back and try to say am I being too hard on myself or is this a problem that needs to be addressed I think so. that's the struggle of being the artist, right? I mean, yes. I do know artists who everything they do, they say, I just made the most fabulous thing. And I think, I never feel that way. <laughs> I feel it's finished and I've done what I have to do on it, but I never feel like it's the most fabulous thing. So, right. Yeah. Yeah. There's always that. But I mean, then that's what keeps you going, I think. That's you right. Because now the next one's going to, I'm going to get a little bit better at it. But um, yeah, I, I sometimes am envious of artists who so do really sort of organic work that it's intentional, but it looks very um, easy. It's not easy, but they make it look, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and I'm always sort of 
envious of people who can work like that. Because I'm, I'm definitely a very rigid, I guess. Well, it doesn't feel that way. And I must say, your work flows beautifully. Oh, thank you. It doesn't feel at all rigid. It feels oh, good. Or it has an organic, and considering you're working with scaffold, scaffolding or that, or those concepts when you work with them, they're very organic feeling, which I don't think is that easy to achieve. So, well, see, that's nice to hear. Thank you. So, there's me again being, you know, critical of myself. <laughs> we are. <laughs> what can I say? I understand it. Uh, my last question is for you is do you have any special tools or devices? that are unique to your process? Um, you know what? I have never been someone who gets a lot of, some people, their studios are amazing and they have all kinds of really cool tools. Uh, and I really just have the basics um, wow. for, for better or for worse. Uh, you know, I have a torch and I have um, my bench and I have a vice and a, I have a, um, a polishing machine, but I don't really have any, any fancy tools, you know, and you, when I do need something, you know, to do something specific, it, sometimes you just kind of figure something out, you know, how can I make this, you know, you kind of make your own tool to suit your need. So uh, yeah, I, I don't really have anything fancy. Just thought I'd ask. Maybe yeah. Now there's a, you know, now it's a good question. And a lot of people have like hydraulic presses and cool stuff like that. And sometimes I think I would like to have it, but uh, I don't know. I just, uh, I just kind of keep it bare bones. And um, sometimes I like to just not even buy much material and just challenge myself to use what I have and see where it takes me. You know, sometimes if you put some parameters on yourself, it makes you um, grow and, and explore avenues that you wouldn't have otherwise. Right. I think that's right. Yeah. Well, it has been a pleasure talking with you. I am looking forward to seeing your, um, I, I will get off and look at your work on the MPA Art Fest site. Wonderful. And that's going to be a pleasure to see. And you've been a delight to talk to. And for the people who've stuck with this long series of the, the three interviews, I thank you for joining us and joining the NPR Art Fest interviews. And if any of you noted that at the beginning, I said there were 12 artists participating in MPA Art Fest. That was a mistake. It was 52. So please note the correction. Thank you for being with us. And thank you for joining MPA Art Fest. And do not forget to visit the wonderful work by the wonderful artists who were involved. Thank you.